Dr. Andre Shosh, Director of Conservation and Veterinary Services at the Budapest Zoo, to deliver his presentation entitled In the Pusta, Steppe and Semi Desert Anastasia Transport and Reintroduction of White Equids. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank for the invitation. And uh, as um, uh, Viola said, uh, we work uh, together for many years uh, with Ortovai National Park. And uh, I would like to share some of the experience uh, I have uh, with the Hortobach horses, uh, the Russian transport, and also I was uh, fortunate enough to work um, in uh, Mongolia and Kazakhstan uh, with this uh, project and wide equids in general. Um, I see it here, but I don't see it on the stage. So is small technique. Yes, it's here. So, uh, yeah, I gave the title in the Pusta Steppe and Semi Desert because, as you can see, these wide equids really inhabit uh, different habitats. And um, I think I will not go into a lot of details uh, about the story of the Przewalski horse, but um, I would like to highlight that this is one of the species which uh, zoos in general are very proud. And it shows that zoos and uh, um, breeding in captivity has um, uh, a good uh, value and uh, can uh, bring back species from extinction, but at the same time, a lot of things, a lot of uh, efforts must be made uh, to protect the species in the wild. So as, as Viola said, um, General Nikola Przewalski uh, discovered the Przewalski horses in uh, 1881, and uh, this horse, uh, after a long story, unfortunately, extinct from the wild in 1969. But um, fortunately enough, Karl Hagenbeck, who was a very famous um, um, zoo uh, person uh, and the uh, founder of Hamburg Zoo uh, just uh, also captured horses. So you can see that all specimen uh, alive today are descended from the 12 individuals which were captured by uh, Karl Hag Hagenbeck and survived. So uh, to put the story short, um, after the uh, Second World War, uh, only uh, Prague and Munich uh, Zoo had animals and coordinated breeding started back in the 1970s. Um, breeding programs both in Europe, these are the EPs and North America, these are the SSPs, um, started semi-reserves uh, were founded, these are fenced areas, and the reintroductions took place in Mongolia from the early 1990s. So, uh, the Hortovai National Park, uh, Viola also uh, gave a few words about this, but this is a, a fantastic place, which is um, also um, a World Heritage Site. Uh, this is a very diverse uh, national park, and also very famous, mainly famous, or what's famous uh, previously for birds. Uh, more than 320 bird species occur there, and it's a very important place for uh, crane stopover, or uh, for example, other uh, nice species like the dotterel in the, um, in the bottom uh, right corner of the slide. So, uh, horse project in Hungary, when it was started in the mid-1990s, uh, um, Hungary was always considered to be an equestrian nation, but um, um, grazing and uh, habitat management was very, very important, as Viola said. So um, it was actually um, the bringing back the uh, li um, a large herbivore uh, and manage the habitat. Uh, partly, as I wrote it here, uh, to maintain uh, endemic plant and animal species um, ecosystems. So uh, the Pentazook uh, Pea Horse Reserve is a very interesting area, which is a, a kind of semi-reserve because it's fenced. And we have um, the project here, and this was the source, of course, um, for the horses for the Orenburg project in Russia. Uh, some beautiful pictures um, about this um, really nice uh, pusta area, and um, also on the um, bottom, uh, right bottom corner, that's the Great Bastard, one of the treasures of um, uh, Hungary um, as a, um, a natural country. Um, so what are the goals of the project? Uh, as I said, na nature and landscape protection, species protection of Przewalski horse, and uh, the Hortobach horses are member of the European breeding program, which is very important. At the same time, the heck cattle, or uh, the other name is aurochs, are uh, kept there also for further breeding and forming the breed. And the research, of course, is very important. So I will show all the elements in details. Um, the Przewalski horse uh, is originally uh, from uh, Central Asia, and uh, the largest population, this is also very important, can be found uh, at the Hortovai National Park. Uh, it's uh, around uh, 300 horses right now. Um, the 
project, uh, because here also extreme value conditions can occur, um, has a goal of minimal human intervention and uh, maximum 30 days of feeding uh, a year, uh, which sometimes uh, can happen. And uh, you see this number here. Unfortunately, I didn't um, make it um, um, up to date. Maybe Viola can tell. But you can see that uh, this is a very good uh, breeding uh, place for the horses. And uh, EP animals uh, um, are here and a good source of horses. And uh, also good source for the Mongolian reintroduction, as horses were um, taken here uh, directly to Mongolia. OK, so now I'm going to my field, veterinarian uh, stuff. Um, the research started um, um, as a, there are many research projects, of course, about um, parasites, about behavior, uh, about um, using the habitat. But this is a veterinary-related um, research, which was done by the Vienna University. And the question was uh, how these horses can adapt to these very harsh um, conditions, climatic conditions, uh, how they regulate their metabolism during the winter. And uh, we measured body temperature and heart frequency with um, high developed um, uh, technical instruments. And you can see uh, on the picture on the left, uh, we, can, we could even um, just uh, do surgery um, in uh, field conditions. Uh, if you have uh, all the equipment and you know what you do, uh, it's possible. So for this, um, we had to catch the horses. We had to provide uh, just um, conditions uh, which are surgical, um, aseptic conditions. And we put these devices under the skin of the horses. And the, you can see some of the pictures here um, of the surgery and also uh, some of the pictures when the horses uh, were reversed, the anesthesia was reversed. And also, you can see on the right side a radio telemetric collar on one of the horses, how to follow them. Uh, there are other horses, uh, a lot of researches are going on. Viola also mentioned the genetic resources, how DNA samples are taken from the horses by the biopsy needles and the help of the dart guns. Um, and also, uh, how the researchers, how the scientists uh, follow the genetics of the different horses uh, just um, individually. Um, also, research about mutations, uh, like you can see some of the um, color mutations, like the star, that's the domestic horse feature on the left side, curly hair stallion uh, on the top uh, on the right side, and the fox mutation. Of course, these horses uh, are not needed uh, to maintain the species uh, properly. And also, uh, some of the cracked hooves you can see. You could imagine that uh, such a big place for horses would be an ideal place, and you would never encounter uh, with hoof problems. But this is unfortunately not the case. Sometimes uh, we encounter these problems. And even during anesthesia, uh, we uh, try to do hoof trimming if it's, if, it's, uh, if it's needed and if it's possible. Of course, we don't want to continue with these genetic lines. So uh, etology is a very important research. And I just uh, really would like to highlight what Viola said. Um, it's very, very difficult to recognize the horses individually. And I really just uh, respect the uh, field biologists there who can do, because when we do uh, our veterinarian uh, work at the field, uh, it's not just one horse, uh, not, not any horse, of course, uh, which we have to transport or we have to anesthetize. It's usually a particular horse, uh, which they just uh, really recognize according to the feature, which was shown by Viola. And I think it's, it's a fantastic um, um, knowledge what the uh, field biologists have there, and uh, they uh, help the veterinarians uh, to carry out uh, the work. So as it was said, Shavalsky horses live in harems on, or bachelor groups, and um, um, this is an important feature to know when we work with them. So you can see uh, how we uh, work as veterinarians with the horses. So we uh, also follow the minimally invasive approach. So we only intervene if it's very important. Uh, exceptions are only welfare exceptions, because uh, the lack of uh, large predators just uh, doesn't allow um, properly um, to live uh, naturally uh, the population dynamics. We have to intervene. Um, there are lots of tricks. I will show you lots of videos uh, very soon, uh, how we approach horses, what happens when we uh, dart the horses, what happens, how they go down. Uh, there are lots of tricks. Uh, in the Horto badge, of course, it's a pusta, uh, and very few uh, hides are there. So we have to know it. Uh, fortunately, because of the intensive research, uh, horses, uh, no people, no biologists. So um, 
except for the very um, cunning ones, uh, they, um, they don't really afraid of people, but sometimes it's difficult to uh, approach them. Distance issues is very important, I will show, because the dark guns we use, usually the maximum 50, 60 meters we can shoot. Uh, this is just the characteristic of the guard, dart gun. You have to know it, and you have to use it. Camouflage, I will show what kind of camouflage we can, we can use um, to um, trick the horses. I will talk about drugs, needles, um, and all the rest about how we handle, uh, how we transport animals in the grassland, uh, how we try to uh, relax them uh, using also drugs for transport. These are called the LANs, the long active neuroleptics. Um, and what we do uh, with other things. One important thing which I would like to highlight here too, I, I think it was also said by Viola, that uh, the Hortobite horses are really very, very good horses for introduction because they're coming uh, with the proper training. If you take a horse from the zoo, which uh, has a, a relatively smaller exhibit and um, a very good hotel life, getting the food, getting the, the proper care. It's a little bit different in the Hortobite because the Hortobite is a harsh place. So ho the horses have to survive. If they survive properly, uh, they are good candidates uh, for reintroduction. And that's why uh, it was already proven that uh, these animals went to Orenburg and went to Mongolia with success. So let's see uh, what we do. So what are the reasons for anesthesia? Um, of course, individual identification, bending, you can see it on the left side. Um, if we transport horses, we have to test them. Uh, these are veterinary conditions for certain um, infectious diseases. Um, and uh, we have to put them into a boma or into a confined area uh, for quarantine. Of course, a uh, reason for anesthesia can be transport. Like uh, these horses, as I said, part of the breeding program. So it can happen that these horses are sent to another place or we are getting horses. So every year, even there is no reintroduction uh, project or there is uh, no transport to Russia, uh, we anesthetize horses. And even within the Hortobad, uh, it um, is possible that we move horses from one place to another. A medical condition is a rare occasion, but sometimes it can happen. Uh, especially if there's a welfare reason. So um, let's see, um, anesthesia. I, of course, I don't want to into details, and uh, I just uh, put it here if uh, for any reason a veterinarian sits in the audience. Um, but um, one thing which uh, is maybe important to mention, that the evolution of protocols. We um, learn by doing things. Uh, and of course, uh, there's, a, there's an evolution of different drugs. Um, and. Um, at the beginning, we used a uh, drug sol solemnly. Um, this is um, called atorphine, which is an opioid, and it's a very dangerous drug. Uh, at the same time, two veterinarians have to work, because if there is um, an accident, the other can help. We still use this drug. This is very important for Vidaquids, but we combine with other drugs. Um, and um, you can see this protocol we use actually a combination of three or four drugs, uh, drugs uh, alpha-2 um, and opioids and we have effect within a few minutes. Uh, if we have to top it up because the transport is long or um, we uh, want to do something and the time is not enough, they, we use ketamine drops uh, intravenously. Um, it's very important what kind of needles we use because uh, if it's a big distance, um, the uh, needle and the dart can bounce uh, back. So we use uh, long needles uh, which are colored and um, uh, also, we have to think about what will happen after the, um, the horse. So we have to, when we finish the procedure or the transport or the horse is released, we have to um, uh, reverse the horse, especially in those areas where there are uh, wild predators, like in, in Kazakhstan, and not talking about just horses or, Mo or Mongolia, also talking about uh, wild ass. Uh, species, uh, you cannot have uh, the luxury that you release an animal and maybe half an hour later, because it's still sleepy and not moving properly, uh, uh, a wolf will uh, catch it. So let's see. Um, I would like to show you a little bit of what the difference is between a field condition and a um, uh, uh, zoo condition. Uh, these are um, hack cattle and just the um, light blue um, circles. You can see those muscles, which are primary target areas uh, for a dart. And you can see um, the difference and the challenges. Uh, of course, there are individual differences. And in captivity, in smaller place, um, uh, or um, uh, regarding the mental state, us usually you have to also differentiate uh, what amount of drug we use. And also, you have to see that um, in, uh, in a captive condition, this is a water bug, 
uh, you see two darts in the uh, time muscle of this water bug. So actually you have, uh, you have uh, space enough because these darts not fly, this is just after uh, it's already there is an effect of uh, the anesthetic drug, but it was easy to dart this animal twice. Um, you don't have a chance for uh, two darts uh, in the field. So yeah, it means that uh, you use uh, a dart which has a 3C volume, 3 cc volume, so it's very small, and at the same time, um, so you have one shot, that's, uh, you, you have to also hit the animal, but at the same time, uh, it means that you use very, very concentrated drugs. The drug I mentioned, uh, atorphine, um, is um, the combination what we used in the past, uh, it was called large animal immobilin, it was produced in Europe, uh, and um, um, two drops kill a, kill a person, and we use uh, one cc at least for, uh, for an adult uh, Pravalsky's horse, uh, which means uh, 20 drops. And now, because it's not available anymore in Europe, uh, we import the drug from uh, South Africa, which is four times more concentrated than, uh, than the drug from, uh, from Europe. So you can imagine it's really dangerous. So you have to be careful about uh, people and animals when you do these um, uh, conditions, uh, these interventions. So what are the other uh, challenges? Better conditions. If the water level is high, of course, we cannot work. Extreme cold or heat we would like to uh, avoid. Um, this is, for example, I will show you pictures about uh, Mongolia uh, when I worked there in 2007. It was um, midsummer, and um, because of the um, of the very hot conditions, now in Mongolia it's not possible to do any kind of uh, field capture in the summer. Um, this is uh, now um, a decision of the authorities. Um, also, as I said, you um, uh, the drugs uh, which we are using is quite difficult to obtain, and um, the. Um, rows um, in the bottom line of the of the slide just show uh, we have a very strict human protocol. If for any reason, hopefully it will never happen, but if for any reason um, um, an accident happens, then the other veterinarian who is in the field have to help the one um, in need. So uh, this is the selection. I'm walking here with Viola, uh, and uh, Viola will show uh, the horse. Uh, you see uh, the horses are still relaxed, and uh, I try to hide the uh, gun, the dart gun, on my left side. Um, this, is, um, this is the good part, because still uh, they're just uh, relaxing and um, just grazing. So if uh, we have the selection, um, sometimes, very rarely, it happens that we can close them in because of drought, and they come and we can close them in a smaller place, then it's easy. But it happens very, very rarely. Usually, uh, it's um, on the field and uh, the field biology show, uh, shows uh, what animal to take. If uh, the um, uh, animal is selected, we do the darting, then they, usually they don't know what happens, uh, and they, they just run a little bit, and after that they look around, okay, which one was, uh, was hit, but sometimes there are really, really um, clever ones, and they just go away, or it, it also depends on the mood of the animals, uh, whether on that day they are just in a, you know, vendoring move and whether they will stay. So, uh, what kind of other camouflage tricks you can use? Um, on the top um, left corner, that's uh, my colleague um, Ishvan Shandor, who is using this, he's the man in white, uh, who is using uh, this uh, uh, coat to try to dart a horse, uh, but um, it's not easy in the winter time in the Hortobad. And on the left side here, I'm just pretending I'm a tourist because there's a tourist bus that some of the horses uh, just like tourists, but they hate uh, field biologists or veterinarians especially. Uh, so I try to um, just sit in the tourist bus and try to, try to shoot the horse. Or even sometimes we have to, because if they have some additional uh, feeding, um, then uh, it can happen that um, uh, if, I, if I sit in the track, in the tractor, uh, then um, I can approach uh, them better than just walking there. So um, these are just uh, the pictures. Uh, this is um, an ideal um, darting site uh, on, the, um, on the right, on the Przewalski source. But sometimes uh, you can see just the right moment. It was not an ideal darting site of that uh, Kulan on the uh, top picture. Uh, but actually, that was, a, that was a shot from more than 70 meters. And that animal really uh, exactly knew uh, the, the distance, the range of the dart gun. So it was a kind of change, and, and um, there were, I think, uh, before that uh, two uh, trials, and the animal, um, they couldn't uh, catch the animal, so finally we could catch it, even uh, it's, um, the dart went a little bit lower, was expected. Uh, on the 
left uh, side, uh, left uh, bottom picture, you can use, uh, we can use this uh, memory infusions, which is used for cattle, just to um, put antibiotics into the wound, which is caused by the heat of the dart gun. Okay, so the effect. On the left side, you can see a very uh, typical effect of the atorphine, the opioid drug. Uh, the um, horse uh, will uh, walk uh, in, in very uh, small um, uh, gait, and then we and also separate it from the group. So we try to uh, actually avoid any kind of head injuries and try to um, uh, just um, catch the horse as um, soon as possible. So you can see a horse is already separated. And then um, we approach, because this is uh, now the tricky part. Uh, the animal is basically blind, uh, but um, we really don't want uh, head injuries. So we just cover the eye and the head, and um, it stands still. And after that, if the horse doesn't go down uh, by itself, uh, we help a little bit and we try to put uh, the horse onto the ground. Uh, so after this, this uh, some of these pictures were shown by Viola already. Uh, you can see um, the procedure, which is usually very quick. Uh, here, we also uh, weigh the horses because they went to Russia and we did the banding, uh, testing, uh, deworming, um, if, uh, if it was needed, hoof trimming, all the uh, tasks which are needed on the field. And this is also an atorphine effect. You can see uh, the device which is uh, on, the, uh, on the tone of the uh, animal. This is called uh, a pulse oximeter, uh, oximeter, and it's a pulse oximetry. Uh, and this shaking, this is also a kind of typical side effect of this kind of combination. OK, on the move, uh, animal is put into the, um, um, on the uh, vehicle and then uh, goes a rever um, reversal, and then you have to be very quick because the reversal is, is uh, given IV, so you can see the hind legs, they can kick really, so you want to avoid that. Um, and welfare issues. Uh, I also said that these are usually um, healthy horses, which we test or transport. Welfare issues um, on the radiological picture here, you can see uh, really um, a, very good, a very bad fracture. Um, in these uh, cases, we cannot help, so these animals are humanly euthanized. Um, and um, you can see all the reasons here, which we already mentioned about uh, uh, lack of large predators and um, uh, only the ethical need when we have to step in. Um, also, there are some other research about foal killings, for example, which happens, um, especially with some of the stallions. We don't know exactly the reason for that, but um, uh, it's, it's a managed population in some extent. So, reintroduction. Uh, the Cominta reintroduction site, uh, it's uh, within the buffer zone of the Karas National Park and Prague Zoo. Uh, took uh, horses there, um, also from the Hortomaj. And these are just the pictures uh, which were taken with our horses for the reintroduction. And they use these um, um, army planes to transport horses. And you can see um, the Hortobite horses, maybe on, not on this picture, but um, basically it will be the same uh, when the animals um, are released. And I just would like to speak about also the Orenburg project, where uh, this is, was a large-scale transportation in 2016 and 17. Uh, first year 14, uh, second year 16 horses were transported to a new re reserve in Russia. And this was the biggest transport uh, ever in the history of the species with zero mortality. Um, complex action, as you can see, regarding paperwork, testing, um, pre-export quarantine, anesthesia, and shipment, and um, also a lot of things because it was relatively a short transport, but you, have to, uh, you had to avoid um, different uh, problems which you can encounter with the long transport. So you can see here um, the Hortobad and the Orenburg site, which is uh, roughly uh, 2,500 uh, km. And uh, you can see um, the, all the steps of the procedure, how we um, started to select the individuals. Uh, we had a list of which uh, animals could travel. And then uh, when the animal was uh, uh, in our hands, the banding, uh, they were then put into this um, pre-export quarantine facility. And these are the crates, which uh, were a little bit modified, but these are basically the prac crates and very good crates uh, were made by the um, Hortobaj National Park. Sniffing dogs before the transport. If uh, for any case um, there's an idea, uh, they thought maybe we wanted to transport something else, uh, but it was not the case, of course. 
And then uh, when the day come, um, they came, uh, we had to put the horses to the airport uh, for the uh, special um, um, plane. You see uh, our um, drugs which we use, quite a complex um, and it's uh, quite important to know what kind of drugs in, uh, to use in, in certain situations. And then um, it was racing with time because um, when the day came, uh, after the one month uh, um, pre-export quarantine period, we had to put these horses um, to the crate and then put them to the airport and these were autumn times when we had shorter days so even the horses were in a confined area it was not easy so you can see uh, and some really wanted to stay actually uh, on the on the very first year uh, when we transported 14 horses on the papers it was 15 horses and it was a very lost horse and uh, because the crate is small uh, we put the horse into the uh, opening of the crate, we give, we give the reserve and then we push the horse into the crate. And this one, this last one managed to come out, so actually it stayed in the Ortobite, it didn't want to go to Russia. Um, so this is, uh, horses are, rare, are there on the, um, on the transport, uh, I'm just checking the horses uh, inside in the crate, and then uh, it's already um, night time. It's um, this special uh, device which puts the crates with horses into the um, um, inside area of the, of the plane. And uh, the horses are in safe hands. You can see these are the two pilots before landing to Russia. Um, maybe they also had the same, a long day. But um, as you can see, we landed and we are here. So it's a, um, it's a happy ending. And then movement at the airport. This is the arrival. Um, the first year, it was very, very cold. In the Hortobaj, uh, it was uh, 10 degrees um, plus, and uh, on the following morning, it was uh, minus uh, 28 in, um, in Russia. So the horses, um, really, um, you didn't see the big difference, uh, but you could see on the people the big, the, the, the big difference. And this is the release. Um, uh, first year, it was in night time, uh, and it was coordinated release. A lot of media was around how the horses uh, come out after the transport. Uh, it is a fence place um, in, um, in Orenburg. And um, you can see that uh, they are doing fine. Um, some of them are a little bit slower, but still you don't see any kind of uh, effect of uh, anesthesia. So um, then uh, I don't have a lot of time, so I just would like to show some similar pictures how I've worked with a wide ass um, in uh, uh, the Gobi Desert and in Kazakhstan. Uh, Asian wider species is a very interesting um, and very uh, complex, um, taxonomically complex group of animals. Uh, they uh, live in steppes, semi-desert, and, de and deserts. Some of them are extinct, unfortunately, and some are in, um, in big trouble, like uh, Onagar in Iran, or um, Indian Vidas, Turkmenian Vidas, and, and the Mongolian Kulan. May mainly the only exception are the Kiangs um, in um, the high altitudes of uh, uh, China, India, and Nepal. So this is the, um, this is the uh, Mongolian Kulan. Um, I uh, worked um, in two countries already with them. And um, um, this is um, more or less um, what we know about than 20,000 individuals. It's a vulnerable species. Uh, unfortunately, it's a declining population due to a lot of reasons, uh, poaching, habitat loss, and competition with grazing animals. It's quite interesting. And even uh, there's legislation, um, but in reality, still uh, a lot of um, uh, poaching is going on. So these are pictures uh, which uh, were taken uh, by me and my colleagues in Mongolia. This is a collar, how we found one of the um, Mongolian wide ass. And actually, this animal was shot. So you can see uh, the, um, the remnants of this, uh, this collar and the signs of um, this uh, shooting in uh, injury. Others also was found by us. Uh, are killed by snares, so still um, it's a very heavy pressure on the population. Uh, this is the motorway in the Gobi Desert, uh, where you have to approach these animals. And uh, the one place where we worked was uh, in Mongolia, also a place which is a uh, reintroduction site um, of the Pshavoskis horses. So, again, research. Uh, there's a lack of information. What happens with these animals uh, for effective protection? how large the area they use, what the social structure, what the diseases are. And for this, radio telemetry uh, was um, a tool. Uh, and uh, for this, animals must be captured, and vets needed, of course. 
So um, what are the coolant catching facts? Uh, they also live in open habitat, that's difficult to approach them. Um, and they start to flee from a few kilometers, very different from the Hortobach horses, because uh, they're afraid of people. Uh, people uh, mean something wrong for them. So uh, as you can see, the range of Dargons, I put even 80 meters here because it's um, the type of the Dargon, but usually 50, 55, maximum 60 is the type of Dargon which we use with the um, um, carbon dioxide um, cartridges. But of course, this is, um, this is um, depending on very much um, the weather circumstances, especially wind is not our friend. So, and as said uh, already, we are using extremely dangerous drugs. Um, what are the methods? One is the hide at the water hole, if you have one, and uh, for this drought is needed, very time consuming, it's safer, but more difficult for logistics because someone is sitting um, just um, uh, close to a water hole, maybe for a week and maybe catches one. So we chose, it's not our method. The other one is the jeep chasing, which is actually a method for, um, for um, uh, poachers. Uh, you need a special vehicle, the role of the driver is really crucial, and it's dangerous but extremely effective. So I will show you some pictures. Um, this is the water hole method on the left. This is um, the UAS used for jeep chasing. You uh, just um, take out the window on the right side and the mirror and uh, try to catch the animals. These are the ingredients, the um, extremely dangerous drugs, your dot gun with a short barrel and um, the radio collars. And this is one of the sites, uh, they already did it for several times, so they had a special uh, vehicle uh, with these um, extra um, tubes uh, to have um, a safer environment if the jeep um, turns around. Um, and then, uh, what are the uh, facts? We have an animal which is between 200 and 250 kilo. Uh, we cannot change the dosage during the chase. Um, we don't chase a, a mare with a foal. We have only a 3cc dart, and we have a very high dosage of very, very dangerous drugs. So, uh, the chasing, they flee from at least from 1 km. Uh, the Jeep approaches, uh, their maximum speed is uh, about 75 kilometers uh, in an hour. That's uh, for the, um, for the uh, stallions, and the mares have about 65, uh, and we are shooting from a moving object to a moving object. Then we have to follow up, we have to find them, and the chase cannot be longer than uh, 50 minutes. Okay, so just before start, um, this actually these pictures were taken in Kazakhstan in 2019 autumn. Uh, you see the jeep, you see all the stuff on the right side, uh, also the, the safety uh, measures and uh, the base camp where we start. And um, this is Mongolia. You can see, um, actually, this uh, car was just hired in the village. You can see the windows which are removed and then these animals I really don't like uh, when people approaching them uh, in the, in the semi-desert. This is um, um, the, what you see, and then the animal is getting closer. Adrenaline level is very high, I think, in every uh, living creature around. And this is um, how we dart, if it's possible. And this is how it looks like in practice. This is actually uh, Albert, uh, who will uh, present uh, here just, um, uh, I think, in two weeks' time. He's driving. This is Kazakhstan. And you see, this is far from an ideal uh, shooting. And you have to approach them. Uh, there are, the, um, there are a, lot of, a lot of things to avoid, um, especially turning around with the Jeep. And sometimes, um, this is practice too, especially in Kazakhstan. This was the RLC region. And um, there are a lot of um, uh, plants with thorns and uh, we had tire punctures several times. So actually, we had to order a special tire to continue our field work. Okay, so this is already when you were successful and your animal is blind and approaching you, and then anesthesia usually, um, as, as I said, it's very effective within a few minutes. You approach from the back, you fix and cover the head. Uh, sometimes a small wrestling is needed. Um, sorry for that. But then uh, it's usually a short intervention uh, with about 15 minutes. And then all the measures, how we try to make it safer, the anesthesia. We use pulse oximetry and we monitor the animals. We put the, um, the radio collar. We collect blood uh, for testing, especially for different infectious diseases. And then we do antidote re recovery, especially with naltrexone, the full, full antagonist, because uh, we really need animals which are 100% uh, uh, awakened. There are some rough recoveries, there are some uh, smoother recoveries of animals. 
And then, if you are lucky, the different uh, colors show different animals. And you can see they really cover huge areas. Um, for the uh, comparison, it's 250 km uh, on the bottom. And uh, there is the Mongolian-Chinese border. That's why they close, because there's a fence. And uh, in Kazakhstan, where we work, it was a different situation because we had to uh, transport animals within the country. So um, we had animals because in Mongolia, we caught the animals, we collected samples, and we released them. In Kazakhstan, we had to catch them and we had to put them into a boma. That's why we could only work in the ROC region for a 10 km radius. And then we put the animal on the track on, to the boma. You can see, um, and at the beginning, the boma was not high enough, and animals were just jumping over. So now uh, it was important to learn that um, 280 centimeters high bomas are needed at least. Um, and uh, we did this uh, 850 km long inland transport in 27 hours, and then we released the animals um, in central Kazakhstan. You can see the um, color on the Kulan. And if you can avoid this kind of transport, I strongly recommend you, because this is really too long. And um, um, we just decided, it was uh, Petra Kaczynski and um, her group, that uh, if uh, this work can continue, then uh, uh, the air transport would be preferred. So uh, thank you very much for, I'm um, about two minutes late, sorry for that. And special thanks for all the Hortobai team and all the people who are just uh, mentioned here and with Vidas is Petra Kaczynski and the International Kulan uh, Catching Team. Thank you for uh, your attention. <laughs>